This episode of Hustle and Pro is brought to you by Interactive Sports Group. Interactive football empowers athletes to play football in a fun and safe manner utilizing their patented wearable technology equipment. Find out more at interactive-football.com. Interactive Football, the evolution of non-tackle football. Welcome to Hustle and Pro Season 2, talking sports in Frisco from youth to pro. Now here's your host, Kelly Walker. On today's episode of Hustle and Pro, we welcome University of North Texas's Vice President and Director of Athletics, Ren Baker. Hello and welcome, Ren. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to, uh, good to join you. It's a beautiful day and uh, hopefully uh, things are all uh, continue to, to look up and improve in the middle of this pandemic. So it's, yes. uh, it's fun to be with you today. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. So first, I have a few quick hits to sort of just quickly get to know you and your sports background a little bit better. Who would you say is your favorite athlete, like of all time? Carl Malone. Oh, that was a fast one. Okay, then this might answer the next question. What's your favorite sports to, sport to watch? That's a great question. My, I have a, a background in college basketball. I coached for a few years, and, um, and so I enjoy, there's aspects of the game of basketball that I enjoy uh, to watch the most. Mm-hmm. But, but at the same time, I always say there, that uh, there's – happiness and ignorance. And so I probably uh, do a little more uh, coaching inside my head for basketball. So I'm going to say football uh, would be my favorite to watch. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, but, but basketball is the one that I probably uh, am, am analyze and, you know, break down the most. Yeah. You probably watch that with a little more intensity or different focus. That's right. What about your favorite sport to play yourself? Definitely basketball, um, and uh, I played everything growing up. I grew up in a small town of, of uh, about 900 people, and so there were lots of opportunities to get involved in anything you wanted to get involved in. Yeah. And um, but you know, I, I think, uh, and I probably was better at both baseball and football. Uh, but basketball was always kind of where my my heart was, and so to this day, um, I still like to hoop a little bit and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm probably as good of a screener and fowler as there is uh, anywhere. Wow. Okay. So where'd you, <laughs> where'd you grow up? What small town or what area are you from? Valiant, Oklahoma. It's in the far Southeast uh, corner of the state. And um, a lot of people in the DFW area will um, have been to Broken Bow Lake or at least yep. heard about it. And sure. so I grew up about 20, 20, 25 minutes from there, same county. Okay, gotcha. So that was small enough where, like you said, you could play anything, even through high school, probably. You were able to... Yeah, yeah like definitely. I mean, you could, you know, be in, vo- in the uh, music, vocal music, you want to be in a play. What They needed, they needed bodies, bodies for everything. So, uh, you know, you, you got to be a part of a lot of, a lot of things. That's one of the advantages of growing up in a small town. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we were, we were all very active. There wasn't much else to do besides school activities. So, um, a lot of my friends and I, we did stuff together every single day because of that. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Last quick hit. What's your favorite sports movie? Jerry Maguire. Uh, I've probably seen Jerry Maguire 30 or 40 times. Oh my gosh. We watched it over this last weekend and I was supposed to leave the house to go I don't know, grocery or something. And I couldn't leave because I had like, I kept going back in there to watch a few more minutes. It's just so good. And I didn't realize how much I was saying out loud, trying to quote along with it. It's so great. I, yeah, love it, I, I love that movie. I think it, you know, I don't remember exactly when it came out, but I think I was in high school. Um, yeah. And, uh, but uh, it, uh, it's a great movie. Yes, it is. I know those, the Rod Tidwell scene and everything. Anyway, it's, we could go on. Okay. So via the power of zoom meetings, I have to ask you about this next thing because I saw it in the background where I think you were in your home office. So what's up with the wrestling belt I saw behind you? Yeah. So, um, I loved pro wrestling as a kid and it's been really cool being here at North, uh, Texas because, um, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, went to school here, played on the football team, um, the Von Erich family, two of those brothers, uh, went to school here and played sports here. And so um, we actually have a connection um, uh, with uh, pro wrestling. But just growing up in a small town in Oklahoma, um, we only got two, two television stations and, and, not, and those weren't always consistent. And so 
really, um, you, you get like a handful of, of sports, but it wasn't like it is today where there's college and pro sports on TV all the time. So mm -hmm. the most consistent um, sport like, uh, um, you know, a show was pro wrestling. My brother and I, my brother's two years younger than me. We, we fell in love with it every Saturday morning. We would uh, watch it, pull our, our mattresses uh, out <laughs> and, uh, and uh, wrestle each other and mimic the moves. And so I've always had, a, I've always been a fan. And I, I worked at the university of Memphis as the uh, deputy athletic director and um, one had a chance to, to meet uh, Jerry the King Lawler uh, one day and offered and asked him if he'd ever come talk to the football team because uh, Justin Fuente, who's now at Virginia Tech, was the football coach there. He's also in Oklahoma, and he and I were good friends, and, and he's, he likes pro wrestling. And so, uh, so Jerry came out, and uh, he, gave, uh, he gave me uh, that belt. And so uh, it's a prized possession. Uh, and... Uh, when I, I have all of our athletes over over the course of a year um, and uh, to, to our house to eat, to eat dinner. And really? it's usually the first thing they go to uh, when they're, when they're looking around is yeah. they take pictures with it and it's always a good talking point. Yeah. It caught my eye for sure. I had to ask. It makes sense. I didn't, I didn't, re I remember now some of those connections when you mentioned them. I just, you know, I, and I also think, um, you know, pro wrestling, um, there's a reason why it's kind of consistently, you know, held a, a passionate, loyal, captive audience. Um, you know, they build storylines, they do different things. And so um, I think the other a just aspect into, into, into um, um, how I view it is, is I kind of try to steal a lot of their ideas just in marketing and promotion. I think uh -huh. they, you know, I think they do a great job. And, um, when I was in Memphis, the Grizzlies were kind of the hot franchise at the time. They were selling out every night and really uh, raucous crowds. And so I met with their director of marketing um, and asked him, like, what do you guys, you know, what, what's kind of, how do you come up with all these ideas? Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, he said, we kind of, we, he said, you won't believe this, but we say, what would the WWE do uh, oh, to promote awesome. this? And so, um, you know, I also think that, you know, they've obviously maintained and kept a pretty captive audience for a long time and for sure. uh, I, think, I think you do that with uh, some pretty creative promotions and storylines and um, not all of it's applicable to college athletics but we definitely have incorporated some of that yeah I mean they're and they're still doing it even they're one of these sports that's managed to figure out how to still put on put a product out there when others right now aren't able to um, they're getting creative I guess they just like you said they keep reinventing themselves and putting storylines out there that they're filling up arenas constantly. No doubt. Yeah. Okay. So you were the youngest principal in Oklahoma at the time. Anyway, I don't know if that still holds at 26 years old. So I'm guessing, would you describe yourself as, as ambitious and a goal setting person? Certainly at that age I was, um, you know, I think with experience comes, um, not the loss of ambition, but also the understanding that, um, you know, you can grow where you're planted. And, uh, and so, you know, but at that age, I definitely was wanting to, um, you know, move and get as many opportunities as I, as I could. And really what happened there was, um, again, I go back to, you grew up in a small town, you know, everybody. Um, and, uh, the, uh, my, uh, high school student council advisor after I'd left and was in college and, and, um, working on a master's and all that stuff I'd always maintained a relationship with her but she ended up becoming the principal and then the superintendent and uh, when she became superintendent it opened up uh, her job which was a principal's job and she also had a vacant athletic director position um, and so she wanted she she called me and offered me a job and it was the first time uh, in my life that I hadn't had to beat my head chasing a job. She just called and offered it to me. And it actually wasn't until probably the fifth or sixth call um, where I started getting comfortable with the idea of going back home. And, uh, you know, and, but it was, it was a great learning experience. Um, I really enjoyed the kids. Um, you know, at the time I'm, I'm 26 and I'm probably half of the teachers that reported to me uh, were my teachers when I was in school. Wow. Um, so, you know, you talk about doing those evaluations and that kind of stuff. And I had never really spent much time as a classroom teacher. Uh, so, 
um, it was a very much a learning and growth opportunity. And, and uh, I look back and, and now and realize probably more than I did then um, how many lessons I learned during that time. Wow. Yeah, that would be uh, something to delicately tiptoe through that those waters, I'm sure, of managing the team that you were a student of. That's that's interesting. It, it was it was uh, it was very very enlightening and fun and and the reality is is when I made that decision um, I left Oklahoma State where I was a member of the basketball staff there for uh, Eddie Sutton who's a legendary coach and um, you know I but but I was getting married and I just felt like I needed to have a more stable life make a little more money and so I made that decision kind of with the thought that I was leaving college athletics and um, a year later. I got a call and an opportunity to be the AD and head basketball coach at a startup NAIA program at Roger State. They're Division II now, but at the time they were going to be NAIA. And so, um, you know, if not for uh, being very fortunate to get that opportunity, I might still be a, a principal somewhere. So, yeah. so you know, it's uh, life uh, presents you with opportunities. And, um, and, and so I had uh, one to go back home and it was a great job and a great learning experience, but then ultimately college athletics found me again. And so I, I ended up transitioning back to college athletics. Well, let's fast forward to, to UNT. So last year, the 2018-19 year um, was hugely successful for the University of North Texas. And you got there, I think in 2016 and sort of credited with turning it around which is a huge accomplishment in itself, but this isn't just turning around like, you know, the football team, for example, or something. We're talking academics and fundraising and attendance, new facilities, media agreements and other things. But I'm curious now that you're looking back at, you know, this turnaround you've already managed to do in a pretty quick time frame. what are you most proud of so far at UNT? Well, I think the first thing that, that I would just say is, um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, when you're a head coach or an AD or the leader of any organization, um, you probably get too much blame when things aren't successful and too much uh, credit when they are. And mm -hmm. so um, we've been on a heck of a run, um, but there were, there was so much done in, in the months and years before I got here by my predecessors and, other people in this department at this university that um, built a solid foundation so that uh, when, when I came in here, we really could look at uh, elevating the program and, and, you know, what do we need to do to take this to the next uh, level? So I always try and make sure that I take a little bit of, of an opportunity to give credit while we've set a lot of records um, mm -hmm. in the last four years. I always want to try and give uh, credit to the people before me that did a lot to, to set the table for that. Okay. Um, Very and, good. So knowing that, you know, it, knowing that it didn't just happen because you, you showed up and it happened overnight then, um, you know, maybe what's, I guess what also are you most proud of, but what, I don't know, what was the most difficult yeah. piece to put into play? I think I'm the most proud of the comprehensive success of our programs. I mean, um, you know, I, I, all of our teams have, have really, um, been, been elevated in terms of competitive success and academic success mm -hmm. uh, over the last, um, you know, over the last few years. And uh, I think it was uh, 18, 19 that you're referring to for the first time in our hi in history, every single team that we filled had a winning season. And so I think it's just not that, Hey, it's one sport or, or, you know, it's just your revenue sports that, that we've put a lot of attention and resources and planning and strategies around improving the overall uh, quality of the athletic department and the experience that our student athletes get and the job that we do in helping build them into champions and prepare them as leaders, not just in athletics, but uh, academically and then, and then for the rest of their lives. And so I'm really proud of our coaches and our staff and our student athletes that um, that, you know, we have elevated the program comprehensively and not, not just one or two sports uh, that, you know, for one or two years. Yeah, because some schools are, you know, the football school or the baseball school. So you mentioned comprehensive. I mean, so I said new facilities and media agreements and, and attendance. 
none of those happen can happen independently, really. You're not going to get a good media deal going without people showing up to your games and then without winning and then without new facilities and recruiting and all these different pieces, right? So it's all, I am guessing, it all has to work together. Yeah, um, I've been doing budget playing the last few days, uh, and it's the first time in my time here that we're having to put together scenarios where some revenue streams may be down uh, due to this pandemic. But as you mentioned, once you kind of have momentum, it's just amazing how much um, momentum creates momentum and how powerful it is. And but at the same time, how fragile it can be. Um, but we, you know, what we saw was we had some success and um, that kind of helped build some revenue. And, and uh, then we had a little more success and that gave us a chance to revisit some of our contracts and revisit some of our relationships. And, you know, all of a sudden you look up and, um, you know, pretty much all of your revenue streams have grown. So we went from, you know, a, a budget that was um, maybe 32, 33 million to, um, you know, 38, 39 million uh, over three or four years. And, um, you know, that takes a lot of effort and a lot of work from a lot of people and, and probably uh, a little bit of luck as well. But we definitely have seen revenues grow across the board. And that's allowed us to continue to double down on those investments in our student athletes. I mean, you know, you look at, I always bring up one example, but our nutrition budget went from 50 grand to 400 grand. Well, that goes directly into uh, meals and snacks and, and uh, supplements and that kind of stuff for our student athletes. And, and obviously um, that's, that's been something that's uh, been a part of, of the uh, success of our programs. Yeah, I mean, every little bit makes a difference. It all can move the needle in some way and ends up, yeah, contributing to the overall goal. So those kids you mentioned, so how many sports and how many roughly athletes do you have? So we have um, right around 300 athletes in 16 uh, different sports. Now, okay. um, when, I, when I bring that up, um, track and field, for instance, uh, that we have a men's team and a women's team, and they play a, a – uh, they, they, they have a fall season and a, and a spring season. And so that counts for four. Uh, and then – um, we have men and women's cross country, mm -hmm. which a lot of times they double up and they run distance events at track and field as well. So, right. um, so you know, that segment of athletes in some ways, uh, they count for six sports. But uh, we have 16, which is the requirement to be in football's highest division, uh, FBS, um, and about 300 athletes. 300 athletes. That's a lot when you say you eventually get them all over for a family din or a dinner at your house. Yeah. My kids love it. My wife uh, loves uh, the interaction with the, with the players, but uh, definitely it puts a lot of strain uh, on her when we start kicking those off in the fall, but I try and cater the meals and, yeah. um, you know, and, and uh, we have a house that's kind of built for, for entertaining. It's a lot of the space is in the central lot, in the central area, kitchen, dining room, uh, living room, it's all open. And uh, then that opens onto the patio. So we're able to entertain 35, 40 pretty easily. Uh, we can get up to 50. So uh, we knock those out, uh, uh, most of them in the fall. And then what we do is in the spring, we host a big donor event. And that's when we bring football and we bring in big tents to do that. So, cool. so uh, but, you know, I think when you're um, the head of a department like this and, and uh, you're reliant on the success of others to – to, uh, to kind of help your priorities and initiatives be advanced and, yeah. and your goals be reached. Um, you know, you want to share back with them. And, um, you know, I don't, uh, I'm the one thing I miss most about coaching is not the games or anything like that. I just miss the day to day personal interactions with the players. Um, and so it just is a chance for, um, for us to do that as a family and also, for my kids uh, who are young, um, to, for them to see like, hey, when dad's not at our event or our program or he's not here to put us to bed, it's because, um, uh, you know, he's, he's got to be there for these, for all of these uh, young people. And so that kind of helps them, I think, yeah, you know, I understand too the, the magnitude of the job. And, um, and they think those kids, they think our student athletes are there to play with them. I mean, they immediately grab them by the hand and start leading them off to trampoline or swing set. Or, That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's a fun experience for my family. That is cool. 
So speaking of bringing people into your home, I'm curious, were you as curious as me if you watched the NFL draft to see inside, um, well, player homes, sure, but mostly um, NFL, either coaches' homes or wherever they were uh, doing their picks from? Yeah, some of them uh, obviously have interior decorators and some of them obviously don't. So <laughs> it was it was pretty uh, – uh, pretty curious uh, just to see all of the different uh, surroundings and settings. And I, I think um, – favorites? There's been a lot of talk. Coach Bro got a lot of talk. And Jerry he did. Got a lot of talk. Yeah, obviously. Uh, you know what? Um, I love the look of his home. And Arizona is such a great place. Heather and I, um, we usually go to Phoenix every year. And then we went to Sedona a couple of uh, summers ago. And love Sedona, had just yeah. an absolute blast there. So I'm a big fan of Arizona. Uh, but I will say this, um, uh, my wife, we recently bought some new furniture and she, she kind of wanted to go with that modern, uh, look that was, um, in Cliff's home there. And mm-hmm. I'm all about comfort. And so yeah. we have a lot of discussions around that because the chairs that she thinks look good, I think are, are very inadequate in terms of my comfort. Right. And so I love the look of his place, but I'm not sure that I would, that he looked as comfortable as I would like him. Yeah, there is. A, there's a commitment level there. You got to commit to that look and just embrace it all the way. That's right. And he obviously uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, the two dogs and two, <laughs> two messy kids like I do because his stuff was all white and looked new. So Right. Yes, there's a chapter in life when you can do that. So, <laughs> so talking about those kiddos, so you have two daughters and I'm curious – as people who work in, um, you know, a higher level sports and athletics, I'm curious how you parent if your kids are athletes. So are they playing sports, your kids? They do. Um, you know, they're eight and five, so it hasn't got to the real competitive uh, uh, place yet. Um, and uh, my five-year-old is kind of a competitor, so she tend, she's tended to, to get in there and mix it up a little more. Mm-hmm. Than my eight-year-old, who really just loves the social aspect of it, and you know, but she's not trying to get in there and fight for the soccer ball or anything. Um, I'm very laid back as a as a parent. Um, I I don't uh, I think just my experience of having uh, spent time in the public schools and then having been in college athletics. Um, I think sometimes as a parent, the worst thing we can do is not just let our kids grow and mature and learn through experiences on their own. Um, we try and interject ourselves in, in every situation and um, direct them and coach them and, and solve the problem for them. I, I know uh, there's a uh, psychologist that I read a lot, and he says, you know, we do too much preparing the past for the child, not the child for the path. And yeah. so uh, I really just kind of back off and stay away from it. And I tell them all the time, if, you know, if you don't want to play, um, you don't have to play. Now, if you start a season, you have to finish it. Right. But if you don't want to play soccer this year, you know, don't play. If you don't yep. want to play basketball this year, don't play. Um, now, I, I let them know if, if you don't play a, a, a season or a year, everybody else that does is gaining an advantage on you. And right. It, you know, it's probably it might be up. harder to get back That's right. where you are. Uh, yeah. So I try to educate them on that. Um, and we've had a couple of times where, you know, they um, – they had to miss something that they wanted to do because they had a game. And that's the only thing that I'm very strict about with them is you have a team that's dependent on you and you will be at practice and you will be at games. And it mm-hmm. doesn't matter if there's a birthday party that conflicts, you're going right. to, you know, you have a responsibility to the team and the coach, uh, you know, yeah, and, the, and the coach. But other than that, uh, I don't ever say anything. I never said one word to the coach. I never yelled at my kid. Hey, go get the ball. You need to do this. You know, I don't, Uh, I feel like there's probably a time and place uh, for that maybe later in life. Uh, But right now um, they have a coach and that coach uh, knows more about coaching that team than I do. He's seen them practice and play more. And so I don't get, I don't get involved in it too much. That's refreshing. And even if you do know more than that coach, like if you're, if you're eight year olds on a basketball team and you do know more than what that coach is dealing with, they're the ones who stepped up and volunteered their time to get in there and do it. Right. So I always try to, remember that like I'm not the one out there putting the coordinating these practices and all the ins and outs so I'm gonna let them do what you know do their thing and not try to interject too much 
No question. And, you know, and my wife, for the most part, is the same, although, uh, you know, I think mothers uh, generally get a little more protective sometimes. Um, but I, you know, one example I always give, and um, if my if my wife hears it, she always gets on me for even uh, bringing it up. But um, when, when our eight year old was going to start kindergarten at Argyle, which Argyle is a very highly uh, rated public school district in the state of Texas, they uh, they assigned them a room temporarily, but they reshuffled the deck after a week because they don't want all the dominant personalities in one room and and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And my wife, uh, my, my eight year old at the time was real introverted and shy. And, and, you know, we had moved a couple of times. She had had to change schools and we were kind of worried about what that had done to her from a social development aspect. And so my wife, um, uh, said, Hey, I'm going to go up to the school and tell them I really would think they should, you know, they shouldn't change Addison's room after a week because I just don't know how she would adjust to that. And I said, Heather, based on what, but your zero years of teaching experience, you know, like, I mean, you know, these people do this for a living and they're yeah. doing it for a reason. And, uh, I'm just a trusting person, like trust the professionals. Yeah. Um, and, um, so Heather didn't like my initial response to that, but after we talked it through and I went through my logic, she kind of agreed that, um, you know, we should just, uh, hold, hold off on interjecting ourselves in that. Yeah, so it's hard. that's our approach. It that. is hard to let it go. But like you said, you don't want to, pave the path so much for her that it's too easy for her to adjust. Like you, you know, maybe her adjusting it herself is a good life lesson to learn how to adapt to different personalities or change in a classroom or whatever. It's hard though, as a parent to know, to know when to, you know, keep pushing and when not to. Yeah. You know, you and I are of the age where we've started to lose uh, loved ones. I, I still have both my parents, but I've lost all of my uh, grandparents except one. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like when you when you lose those people, uh, it's such a kind of a feeling of, I mean, I really being scared because they've always been there for you. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you, uh, if you, you know, my grandmother who passed a couple of years ago, like if I was going through a bad time in life or, or in, you know, at work or whatever, I would go home. Uh, they, she had 80 acres and I'd fish and I'd get on the tractor and, you know, like, because nothing there ever changed. It was this safety and security. Um, but the reality is um, because she didn't always solve all my problems for me, my parents didn't always solve my problems for me, you're equipped to deal with it. So I think sometimes there's, it's really hard as a parent to balance the desire to want to be there for your kids with um, the natural uh, just battling through adversity that, right that we need as we grow and develop. Struggles, the pain, like, you know, letting them feel a little bit of that discomfort or pain to figure something out themselves. Yeah. No doubt. Well, I'll be, I'll be curious uh, as they get older and because you're like the prime person that would know how to steer them into, you know, that college path to be, you know, there's, I, I have teenagers, so I have people all around me who they're pretty sure they know how their kid's going to play or get college scholarships and this has been happening for years. So like at age 10, you start seeing people around here that are, that are pushing their kid on a certain path to college. And it always kind of makes me laugh because who knows what, if it's going to work or not, but man, you have a perspective where you really could know how to, how to get your kids in the path that you want. So I hope that um, as they get older, you know, I'm anxious to see how you're able to balance that as a parent. Yeah, it, it and it will be interesting as as they get older and things become more competitive. If I still am able to have the same approach, but <laughs> I would like to think um, that when uh, they need my advice and counsel to pursue their dreams, that that I'm able to help them. But I don't ever want them to pursue my dreams for them. I mean, right. you know. Um, I got a chance to live live a life and do the things I want to do. And I actually went to college on an academic scholarship, not an athletic scholarship. And so I've got a unique perspective even in that regard. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I um, I just want them to, to, you know, I want whatever they uh, choose in life, I want them to aspire to be great. And I want them to work hard at it. And I want them to learn that you got to be able to take constructive criticism and battle through adversity. Um, but if that's music or dance or theater or athletics, it, I, I mean, honestly, it doesn't make me um, a whole lot of a difference. I get to see a lot of games. 
Um, I understand the power of athletics in terms of just helping people um, learn all of those things I just talked about, but, but athletics isn't the only avenue to learn those things. And so um, I really just want my two girls to, to do what makes them happy, but to have the drive to be great at whatever it is that they choose to do. Well said. That's great. Well, Ren, thank you so much for joining us. Go, go mean green. Gotta say that too. And um, thank you to everyone listening and we will see you on the next episode of Hustle and Pro. 